Connectivity Capital, Connect Humanity, the Association for Progressive Communications, Mozilla, and um, the Internet Society. You have some of us here who are working on the report. You have people from the field like Risper and Adriana, who also was with the Mexican regulatory body years ago, who helped uh, pave the way for an unbelievable uh, change in Mexico with social purpose networks. So we're here today to talk to you about a critical thing for sustainability of any network, which is financing and access to capital. Um, we really need a new mind shift and a new mindset, particularly among those that do finance um, networks, whether they're international financial institutions, small organizations like Connect Humanity, we're a, we're a connectivity fund, or connectivity cap well, connectivity capital is already thinking broadly. We need to shift the change toward understanding why it's important to provide capital, access to capital for these small community networks and to work with the networks to build better business planning, longer sustainability planning, but really to figure out how to communicate with some of these um, financiers. I myself have had some interesting moments trying to talk to traditional financiers who immediately hear, gosh, they're volunteer networks. I'm like, yeah, but, but that's, they're working on building up. They're starting up just like any other company. So access to capital is different in different parts of the world. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Ben, who's first up on our agenda to give you an overview of the report. And then we're going to turn back um, into the team to have some perspectives from um, uh, Connect Humanity, from um, Association for Progressive Communications, and Rhizomatic, uh, Adriana, and then we're going to move into Q&A, um, and we're going to hear from Risper about Tuna Panda and what she's been doing and financing issues there, and some Q&A. So without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Ben. Ben, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jane. And thank you, everyone um, who's joining us um, from literally around the world. Uh, thank you all for, um, first of all, tuning in. And uh, this is a topic that we love. And um, I think one of the things that we would love to, to talk about up front and want to highlight is uh, the collective effort that this was to put together. Um, uh, um, Connectivity Capital partnered um, with uh, APC, the Association for Progressive Communications, with Connect Humanity, with ISOC. Um, and the nice thing is that all of us had been doing this um, for a long period of time, coming at it from slightly different angles, um, whether that was with community networks, with municipal networks, with small social enterprises. Um, we had all seen all of these data points of success in emerging markets um, that we wanted to bring together to be able to tell a story and then also create a, a bit of, uh, to demystify what that process is like. Um, one of the highlights of the report is these case studies. And these are case studies of community networks uh, over time that have built up their, their networks with different financing, financing mechanisms. We often talk about crawl, walk, run. Um, so there's distinct phases of what it takes to uh, run and operate a network. Uh, and what we try to do in the report is highlight the different financing mechanisms from when you're starting out, from when you're growing and expanding, from you reach uh, a resource maturity phase um, and what those look like over time and how those transitions happen. Um, so with that, let me jump to uh, a, a few. Um, Jane, do I have the ability to pull up slides or should I? Uh... You should, but we should ask the technical expert with us. Can we help Ben um, show some slides? He needs to share his screen. Can you do that, Ben? Um, yes, I can. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, I think it's really important, um, uh, first of all, that we level set and just talk about what we were trying to accomplish uh, with the report. Um, one of the first things we were trying to do is demystify and empower. Um, there are so many folks out there building amazing different networks of different sizes and different geographies um, with a variety of different approaches. And what we wanted to do is level set 
with a common set of terms and knowledge uh, around what it means to uh, be financially sustainable, what it means, uh, what are the costs associated with running a network, what are some of those baseline understandings that, that everyone um, should be able um, to understand and, and create that common set of language. Uh, our hope is that people go on offense. Um, and what we mean by that is I think a lot of times there's a translation difference um, between those that are owners, those that are operators, those that are financiers, those that are users, um, everyone can be on the same page and then um, uh, uh, community connectivity partners can go on offense, be proactive about what they're saying. They can go to financiers and, and be proactive about understanding what's their value proposition. How do we make uh, uh, money? What's the impact that we have being able to, to be forceful and talk about that in a common set of language. Um, so with that, uh, I did wanna highlight first these 11 case studies um, we tried uh, uh, to have a global perspective in what we were doing. Um, so these are networks um, from uh, uh, every continent, um, from all over the world, from a, a combination of the global north, global south, different technologies, whether it's fiber, um, uh, fixed wireless access, a whole variety of different uh, ones, um, straight municipal networks, um, you know, anything that you could think of, hopefully is encapsulated here in each of those different phases. So wanted to, to stick it and highlight with that. Um, and then I wanted to immediately jump to um, what exactly is a community connectivity partner? Um, specifically, you know, we like the, um, what we call the big tent approach. Um, here we go. Um, we like what we call the big tent approach. Um, you know, there are so many different operators with slightly different le um, legal forms, whether um, you're a social purpose organization, whether you're an NGO, whether you're a government, um, but you're all somewhat achieving the same end. And what we did is we created this Big Ten approach, what we call community connectivity uh, providers. It encompasses what would traditionally be referred to as community networks. Those are uh, CNs that are owned by the local community, which are the users. Um, any of those returns are reinvested back into the community. There's a variety of different legal forms. Sometimes those uh, take the form, uh, 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 often they take the form of, of a nonprofit, um, but of, also often they take the form of a cooperative. Um, but the idea really is that it is owned by the community itself. Municipal networks, slightly different. It, it, it has that um, uh, government ownership at the end of the day. It's within a defined geographical jurisdiction. Um, one of the things that we found in the examples that is quite powerful is um, when you have an outer bound of the network, right? So you have a political boundary of the, the, the area that you're trying to build. It can be really cost efficient to build. You know exactly where you're going to. You have the convening authority of the government. Um, it, it can, um, you know, especially when you want to create longer duration assets like fiber, um, you can really push the cost down when you're able to have those kind of defined scope uh, right uh, uh, off the bat. Um, and the last one we talked about uh, was social enterprises. These are what would be referred to as double bottom line businesses that seek both financial and social return. They often have an explicit social purpose. Um, in the United States, we, we have something called the B Corp uh, uh, law, which is the benefit corporation, where you're taking account not only shareholder returns, but stakeholder returns. Um, and it's an explicit um, uh, structure that takes uh, take the takes those benefits into account. Um, the key with all of these is an element of local ownership, and and with that local ownership comes reinvestment. Um, the idea is that uh, you want these entities to be sustainable, but with the sustainable proceeds, those are then reinvested back often into new expansion and upgrades. Um, so if you could think about a, a fixed wireless access network, you're putting up so, you know, a, a main point of presence, you're connecting the immediate surroundings, um, but as soon as uh, the network is achieving sustainability, you begin to think about the adjacent communities that you can also connect with. You're thinking about upgrading capacity, you're thinking about um, cross subsidy models, whether that's you know, an anchor institution, um, say at a university, and then you can cross subsidize with smaller schools, um, but you're thinking about uh, holistically reinvesting uh, all of the proceeds from that back into the community. Um, I'll jump right ahead. This was another key concept that we think is incredibly powerful, which is the idea of stages of network development. Um, the stage that uh, the network is operating often determines the financing mechanisms that are available. Um, so often in the early years, it's that combination of grants, um, subsidies from government, um, it's, it, um, it, it is sweat equity from 
the owners uh, from the local community itself. Um, but it is a lot of that bootstrapping early, um, you know, it, just get out there and get a network live up and running uh, and, and innovate from there. Um, as you move further on, you have kind of de-risking elements, traditional debt, equity, et cetera. Um, but the, you know, as you kind of grow subscriber count, get into sustaining, growing, and then a maturing phase, uh, different financing options uh, open up. One thing that's really critical that we uh, wanted to focus on in this report is financial sustainability. Um, one thing I think that is critical to highlight, there is amazing resources out there when it comes to community networks. Um, certainly the, the work of uh, ISOC over the years, uh, the work of APC, the work of Connect Humanity, they have put a ton of work into um, understanding why is the network meeting, how to do stakeholder engagement, how to build communities and come together, um, how to have shared governance models, um, et cetera. Um, all of that is amazing, amazing resources that we reference to, uh, but we tried to keep a tight bound here specifically on financial sustainability, um, knowing that there are other resources there that are often a prerequisite, and those are a series of activities that are often done before you kind of get to that financing question of how do we actually uh, grow, sustain, produce cash flow, reinvest that back into the network. Um, the next uh, slide, um, and by the way, this is all available um, uh, online. Um, we purposefully published this in what we call a deck format. We want it to be digestible, whether it's in small pieces, whether it's entirely in a book form. The idea really is, is that people can take it and explain to others. So whether that is a, you know, a tribal community coming together, explaining to various users, um, you know, whether that is a, um, a local government being able to explain it to their citizens, whether that's just a social enterprise putting together what we would call a pitch deck to explain to a local financier we wanted it to be bite-sized in that sense. So this is uh, all of it. All of this is um, uh, uh, um, uh, available. Please feel free to download. Um, it's under Creative Commons Common License. Um, so we want people to use it. We want people to replicate it. Um, and um, nothing would make us happier than to see it in someone else's pitch deck and, and see it available. Um, let me then jump to uh, specifically kind of sources of financing. Um, oftentimes, uh, and these are some of the, the names that folks understand, um, the early access that you get, whether it's through universal service funds or impact and first investors, um, different types of donor agencies. Um, we tried to bucket what would be the predominant sources for that type of network that are available. Um, certainly now in a current situation and then also um, in the future as well. Um, the last point I wanted to touch on um, and then we can um, throw it back open to questions um, is this concept of different types of financing. Um, I think oftentimes when people talk about financing, um, we all kind of come to the table with our own preset of notions. It could be that, you know, banker that sits behind the, uh, you know, big, uh, the big wooden desk. Um, and it, it, you know, it could be somewhat intimidating uh, to kind of more grant supported sources. What we tried to, to really hit uh, uh, home in this report is the spectrum of capital that's available. Um, and oftentimes, if you are either an investor or a community connectivity partner, it's understanding what bucket these various investors uh, uh, operate in, right? We divided them between commercial, sub-commercial, and, and grant supported. Um, and understanding that not all capital is equal, capital has costs, whether that's a reporting cost, whether that's a compliance cost, traditionally with a grant uh, being able to report back uh, um, to, to the grant maker, whether that's a cost in terms of an interest rate to a local bank, whether that's an ongoing cost uh, uh, to an equity holder, which has both uh, financial returns, but also governance and control rights. Someone will you know, want to sit on a board and have say over approval of budgets, of new builds, of where you're going to expand to, um, et cetera. And really placing those options on a continuum. Um, understanding that there are various uh, costs associated with them um, and that they all exist on this different continuum. The critical thing as well that we found is in all of these uh, uh, case studies, all of the CCPs used different mechanisms at different times of their life cycle. 
and it's a very critical point um, because I think a lot of times, um, you know, it, any, you know, especially for the early stage uh, um, uh, operators that are getting up and running, they're going to look at an entity that's been around for, uh, you know, 10 plus years and say, well, we want to use a mechanism just like that. Um, and oftentimes there are, uh, you know, it, it's not always the best fit. Um, it could be they're raising a commercial loan that is, you know, they've got a whole lot of uh, requirements around it. They're going through a commercial bank, et cetera. Um, you, know, you eventually can grow into that, but oftentimes um, starting with a more stage appropriate uh, investment is a better way to go to get up and running as fast as possible. Uh, so with that, uh, let me pause there. Um, all of this information is available uh, online and please do feel free to reach out to us, um, to any of our organizations. I know, um, you know, this is something we all love talking about. So uh, if there's folks out there that have questions, that are actually practitioners in implementing this, um, please, by all means, always feel free to uh, reach out. Thank you, Ben. And for others that are jo um, have joined, we've just popped the, the link to the report in the chat. And those of us that are here on the on the panel can also answer some of your questions. And Carlos Rey Moreno, who's from the Association for Progressive Communications, or APC, is our remote um, rapporteur. And Carlos is helping us keep track of questions you might have and key recommendations or points that you want to discuss in the chat. So next up, we're going to talk about some of the structured um, uh, pieces of the report and different aspects of the report. Um, I'm going to give a, a about two or three minutes on why uh, community connectivity providers are uniquely suitable for connecting underserved communities. And then I'm gonna hand it over um, to Adriana for about 15 minutes on owner operator considerations. And then we're gonna go back to Ben for 15 minutes for um, network financing mechanisms. I'm just asking everyone to stay on time. We're doing really well. And then Risper will come in for another 15 minutes to talk about um, uh, practical experience from a community network in um, Africa, in Kenya, the Tuna Panda Net. So I'm going to quickly say that um, for those of you that don't know community connectivity providers, which might be community networks, social purpose networks, municipal networks, both for-profit and not-for-profit, um, these community connectivity providers are uniquely, uh, uniquely suitable for connecting underserved communities. And why is that? Um, well, if you take a look at many of the um, unconnected right now, you'd, you'd have to take a step back and also look at the policies and regulations in countries, <clears throat> excuse me, where people have indicated over the last 30 to 40 years that universal service would help build out, the market will solve the problem. Well, as we know, about 2.9 billion people are not connected around the planet. This is after 40 to 50 years of regulatory policy and good financing out there by many organizations, but we still don't have people connected. So there's been a bit of a failure, not only a market failure, but a regulatory and policy. What I would probably say is we need a reboot. Um, when you're starting to look at um, certain hard to reach areas, whether it's rural, remote, or urban, you have to think differently about how to connect those areas because the return on investment is different. And with social purpose networks, community networks, municipal networks, these networks are uniquely positioned in communities that know what it's like to be unconnected, that are very practical, that know how to come together in a volunteer spirit, whether you're in the US, Kenya, Bolivia, um, in India, where there are all community networks um, right now, or tribal communities um, throughout the world, indigenous communities, they have the know-how to come together to build um, cohesive, sustainable um, projects and co a cohesive, sustainable connectivity because they know what it's like not to be connected. They have practical skills that can be brought in, but oftentimes the CCPs or the community networks um, have a difficult time of understanding what those access to capital mechanisms are that we're, Ben's gonna talk more about in a minute, what the different owner operator models might be for building a community network and how to speak to some of those um, entities that do the financing. I can tell you um, as someone that's worked with um, community networks in the field, I fully understand the spirit. I know how to work with community, you build lots of platforms and bring in lots of local, local training because you never wanna be the single point of failure. And you're also not doing it for communities you're working with. Um, communities who are building networks for their own communities. Um, but what can happen is an absolute 
lack of one-to-one -one understanding when communities are speaking their language and financing um, experts are speaking their language. When I've spoken to some traditional financing experts um, around the world, when I say, yes, this is a volunteer network, they're doing this, this, and this, they have some startup funding, the minute they hear volunteer, they get, they panic. And I often want to ask them, so you really understand risk? This is not as risky because the community is doing this for their own community. They're invested in their communities um, as people and as um, to, to break the cycle of, of unconnectedness, bring in opportunity, help provide more emergency services to their communities, better opportunity, kids getting educated at schools, working from home. And we're talking again, urban, rural and remote. Uh, the pandemic, of course, showed us that there was a lot of uh, lack of connectivity in places we didn't expect or not affordable um, connectivity or better connectivity. So these community connectivity providers, community networks, municipal networks, and social purpose networks are uniquely positioned because they know their local communities. They know what it takes to start up um, an activity in those communities, and they know how to work with local local experts. So I'm going to turn this back over to Adriana so that we can take a look at owner operator models and from a, from an outside perspective. But again, I want to also posit that if we're looking at different regulatory and policy mechanisms to allow community connectivity providers access to spectrum, licensing, easing up on that, um, I would posit that the financial, um, the way we put financing together has to also change. Um, we can't use traditional model and methodologies one-to-one, uh, -one, we've got to start thinking about how we can provide capital to those communities that's accessible to them, just like a regulatory process might be accessible. It does take a bit more work. Connectivity Capital knows well how that works, but so do all of us that have been working with networks to try and help them get started and so that they're not intimidated by the language that they're hearing. Um, we have our own code when we talk about community networks and building connectivity. Um, the financing world has their own uh, code and, and language. So we've got to find a way to bridge that gap as well. So Adriana, I'm going to turn it over to you. You've got about 15 minutes to give us some perspective on owner operator models. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jane. And thanks, Ben, for this important introduction and giving the, the context of where this important uh, report comes from. Uh, and thanks to the audience for your interest in this very important matter. Uh, yes, as, as mentioned before, what we have called this uh, community connectivity providers uh, with whom we've been working very closely in Rhizomatica and APC, looking at their different efforts, needs, models. But finally, this report unfolds uh, with, with the, the due uh, depth of how they organize, what's, what are their ownership models, their operating models. And it is very important for investors, for foundations, for communities interesting, interested in, in investing and starting a, a community network effort, but also for policymakers and regulations to understand what it takes uh, in each of these decisions of, of ownership and operation. Uh, the, the report, which we again invite you to, to look in depth, uh, explains very clearly the different um, choices of legal structure and that a community decides to to select depending on a number of variables and, and factors. By owner type, a, a community network can be, uh, well, exactly that, uh, a community owned infrastructure and network uh, where the community members are also the users and, and they can also have other anchor users like, like a health clinic, a municipal government as user, but, but the community invests and deploys these infrastructures and then uh, expects to have returns in, in the investment made and also have a, 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 a triple 
bottom line or a social bottom line. So that would be a community ownership uh, model. Another model, depending on a number of local contexts, is a, is a public uh, network owned by, by governments, could be uh, mainly local governments, municipal governments, uh, for a number of reasons, to bring in more competition or because the, the available services are not enough or are not uh, affordable or to have some uh, municipally owned infrastructures that can better serve the community. Finally, we also see local networks that um, have a double bottom line that have once a financial return, but also a social impact by providing internet or other telecommunications services, but that are privately owned. And uh, well, the choice of this legal structure depends upon many things and also impacts in the availability of capital. What is the legal framework available? Is it more, is it friendlier for a nonprofit or for a public par uh, partnership or for a private enterprise that would be uh, an important factor, or is from a, a tax perspective, is it more efficient to set it up as again a nonprofit held by the community, or the licensing is easier? So those are uh, important factors, and as we unfold them, we can better understand which of these structures would make it easier for these local efforts to become sustainable. Uh, now, uh, besides who owns this community connectivity providers, uh, there can be a number of uh, legal forms where they are incorporated, if you will. What is the legal entity behind this uh, CCP? So it, it can be a company with shareholders with limited liability, uh, a private, as I said, enterprise. It could be a government-owned enterprise, or uh, as we have seen many times in the uh, Global South, a cooperative, which is a very interesting model. The first ISP in a cooperative uh, form was uh, Senseleni in, in South Africa. And, uh, and also there are a number of nonprofits like the community networks in, in Mexico, in Argentina, and in so many other countries where they are put together by community members and uh, most of them initially established in, in their early stage as a nonprofit so that they can receive grants and uh, a social purpose license. When, whenever there's a legal regime that favors non-commercial efforts to connect the unconnected, then some communities opt for a non-profit uh, legal entity. So there are, depending on the, on the legal context and also the economic uh, context of, of the different communities, uh, if they are rural or remote, uh, we, we can see how uh, these different ownership uh, models and legal entities are, are important choices. I mean, they in, as they mature, they can opt for a combined uh, form, like Sanseleni, again, for instance, which I love, by the way, the, the meaning is Sanseleni means do it yourself. And they combine all these cooperatives, which are the, the different ISPs in, in the different communities, but they are also assisted in, in other ways by a nonprofit umbrella company that provides some services, capacity building, uh, legal advice to, to the cooperatives. And uh, 
so that's what is really important for the for this community for it's that they they understand what would be the impact of, of choosing one model over the other and uh, what how can they mitigate the risks how can they have a better control or a better way to manage the infrastructure and the the services or how or with under which of these entities it would be easier to do fundraising or to have a less uh, a lesser tax impact uh, so sometimes these decisions are not made uh, consciously until after they start start facing the different uh, challenges uh, of each of the of the legal entities they chose or the ownership model so it is important and this uh, report allows investors and grant makers and the communities interested in deploying their own uh, infrastructures to have uh, ex ante um, information as to how these choices would impact their sustainability uh, also um, Uh, it's not a, um, if the decision, for instance, is to to start a municipal network. Well, then maybe this is in a more urban setting or suburban setting where a munis municipality has the resources and is willing to organize and collaborate with the with the community uh, members and uh, how they can lower their costs and, and prices and, and boost local economic development. That, uh, that would be the case for a municipal network. We, the, the study has this incredible and really valuable case studies of these three different ownership models that I uh, encourage you to, to see, both in in Africa, in the US, in Mexico, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in South Africa, and in, uh, in the rural uh, north of the United Kingdom. And so it is, and that's why we cannot easily talk about replicating what worked in South Africa may be different than what worked in rural Mexico and so on. Um, now, as to, to operating uh, models, uh, once these decisions about ownership and legal entity have been made, it is important also that the community understands, and of course the investors, the, the value chain of a communications network. The a com telecommunications network has a passive infrastructure, an active infrastructure, uh, well, the transmission infrastructure, the spectrum behind it, but also needs a number of passive infrastructure, ducts, towers, uh, rights of way, etc. And finally, it, it can also be a service provider using someone else's infrastructure. And that changes the equation of um, availability of financing in uh, very importantly. So, uh, for instance, we have in rural Mexico and, and in the context of a number of efforts from indigenous communities, we saw this year the creation of a new indigenous mobile uh, virtual mobile operator uh, launched just a few months ago which is a reseller so using the very powerful uh, uh, wireless network an LTE network of a huge consortium the indigenous community is acting as a virtual operator as a reseller offering some intranet content and other um, other value for 
for its community, that which is one of the great benefits. Communities really know what they need, what they want, know the culture, the values, and what kind of uh, local content they could add up to these infrastructures. So that would be a model of uh, a community network offering uh, services, but using someone else's infrastructure. But then there's an integrated operator where, which wants to own everything, all the, the, the access network, the transport or backhaul network, and also offer directly the services. That's the case of, uh, for instance, broadband for the rural north and, uh, and TIC in, in Mexico, which is a 2G and 4G wireless network with, that has most of the, of the layers in the network architecture. And a hybrid one would be, for instance, a, a oper an operator that offers wholesale services through a not open access network uh, uh, to someone else who can then offer it on a retail basis. Uh, it is important given the geography, the avail availability of backhaul networks nearby in cases of rural and remote uh, areas, what is the best model? Um, it is true that behind the philosophy of community networks, there is a will to manage, to be able to be in control of the, of the services, quality, um, pricing, etc. also to be able to offer content that is relevant and meaningful to, to the local members. But it is important to see how this decision will impact the availability of uh, funding. And finally, and because I'm running out of time, the report explains very well how in the different stages of this community providers, uh, they also evolve in what used to be a very local infrastructure, for instance, a Wi-Fi mesh, then can become a, a, a promoter of clusters of community networks and become a meso organization which knows very well a given area, a given country, but supports community networks, providing them technical capacity building, legal advice, um, providing an effort to, on how to build and create local content at, and how to access funding. And, and so that's a, a mess organization in the community network model is a very helpful, and we see them in Rizomatica, Altermundi, San Seleni, that are the like the link between the community uh, local network and the investors. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there, and uh, just uh, we can later back to see how, how these different operating models and, and layers of the network uh, can, can be managed to reduce risk and to make uh, sustainable financing more uh, likely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Adriana. That was fabulous. For those of you joining us, that was a nice um, overview of different owner operator models and some of the regulatory policy, other considerations and legal. Um, for those of you that don't know Adriana, she was a regulator with the Mexican regulatory body IFT and has been a big supporter of communities and much more. So up next is Ben Matranga from um, Connectivity Capital, one of the key authors of the report. Ben is gonna talk to us about network financing mechanisms. Ben, you're up and you have 15 minutes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jane, and, and thank you, Adriana, for uh, laying the groundwork and understanding um, what are the variety of owner-operator models out there. 
Um, what I'm going to do is is jump into to financing, talking about um, kind of how networks generate a, a capital, uh, and then hopefully demystify a little bit about how they um, uh, are able to raise capital. What are the sources of capital? What are the trade offs of those various sources? Um, so with that, I'm going to share some slides and jump right in. Um, Ben, one perspective for you too is that evidently in the room, the slides are very small. So if you can um, describe the pieces of the slides as you're um, walking through them, it's hard for, I guess, the people on the ground there to see all the, all the words. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Jane. And thank you all uh, for, for uh, letting us know that. Um, it, we will also place, uh, once again, uh, in the chat, the link to the full report. Um, for those of you that are in the audience, um, Please, uh, by all means, uh, look this up uh, uh, after, um, reach out with any questions, if, if anything that we describe piques your interest, and then you want to go deeper uh, on the given topic itself. Uh, so uh, with that, I um, wanted to start out with a, a concept uh, that we uh, went into in detail uh, in the report, but I think is really foundational, is this concept of blended capital and, and why it's needed. Um, and blended capital really is, it's what we call the capital stack approach. Um, often you're using a combination, traditional tools, which people will understand, which is equity and debt, but then also uh, in grants. Um, by and large, every telecommunications network in the world, whether it's a community connectivity partner, whether it's a community network, whether it's a big mobile network operator, has some degree of subsidy in it. I think that's one thing that, that is often missing and, and is important to call out. Um, often, you know, big legacy companies have received quite a bit of government assistance over the years. Um, so, you know, it, it, oftentimes when new operators are starting out, especially um, new social enterprises, new private operators, they say, well, do I have to finance it all myself and build it all myself? Um, at times, uh, you know, there will be moments where you will have to uh, uh, find personal sources of capital. But by and large, there is a, a kind of an, an expectation and a norming um, in the sector. And certainly with all of the case studies that we covered, there is uh, access to uh, what we broadly defined as a subsidy. And I'll go into individually some of those uh, specific mechanisms of what a subsidy is. Um, but I wanted to start here and, and really explain this idea of blended finance. Ultimately, the more blending that you have, it lowers what we would call your weighted cost of capital. Um, so equity being the, the uh, typically the most expensive, it's kind of that target return, also the highest risk, uh, then debt, uh, and then uh, ultimately grants. This is all overlaid with a variety of de-risking strategies, credit guarantees, tapping into uh, government resources, universal service funds uh, to decrease uh, that cost of capital. Um, then this next concept that I want to go into that I think is, is incredibly uh, important is how that capital stack changes over each um, stage uh, in the life cycle of a community connectivity partner. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a very critical point because I think uh, oftentimes when, uh, you know, we have the luxury um, you know, at Connectivity Capital, uh, we um, have uh, financed over a dozen different ISPs in 15 markets, uh, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and a lot of times you'll meet an operator who uh, feels stuck. They have grown a business to a certain size. Uh, they know they have ambition, opportunity, um, uh, certainly a need to, to grow to you know, another town, city, community over, um, but they don't quite know what are the resources available. What we tried to do in this report is describe holistically what are those various tools and then give some uh, guardrails about how that changes over time. Um, so one of the things that we talk about here are four distinct stages of uh, a community connectivity uh, provider. The first one being starting, then sustaining, then expanding, uh, then maturing. Um, the idea being that what is the focus at what time of the life cycle of the company will change. So in the early years, they're often grant supported entities. Um, those could be uh, grants from government to get started. Those could be uh, um, uh, actual pre-funded uh, um, from members of the community. Uh, one of the examples that we highlighted was uh, Barn, 
um, broadband for the rural north in, in, uh, um, in northern England. And one of the ways they started was they sold interest in the cooperative to, to users um, at the beginning, right? So people would put up uh, a, a bit of money. Uh, they would also then um, uh, uh, trench some of the initial uh, actual civil works to put in the ducting to lay the fiber, uh, but they would put in that initial capital. It would then um, guarantee them a connection um, once uh, the initial network got built. It kind of gets over that first kind of hump Oftentimes people will talk about the chicken and the egg, what comes first, the capital or building the network. Uh, this was one of the innovative strategies that we saw around actually your users become your investors um, and having a synergy in that. That's one way of doing it that we thought was quite unique and, and that we went into detail. Um, in that first starting phase, there is the initial capital expenditure cost and the OPEX. Over time, as you move towards sustaining, that changes. You, you're talking more about core and distribution capex as opposed to the initial, your first point of presence is up. Now you're talking about um, what are your sources of backhaul? How are you optimizing the cost there? How are you putting up more points of presence? How are you building out the human capital side of the business to be able to sustain uh, the supporting crews? Oftentimes that we find uh, in the uh, early days is, in the early days of operating a CCP, um, everyone's wearing multiple hats. Um, so the CTO, the network engineer uh, can oftentimes be the installer, um, is also the help desk is, is kind of a variety of roles. Um, and one of the amazing things uh, that we always see is um, kind of how all of those people evolve their role over time um, and, uh, you know, rely on, um, users and rely on members of their community that have all these different skill sets um, and are able to adapt. One of the things um, that we also um, tried to unpack a little bit was a little bit of a, a train the trainers model. Um, you know, oftentimes um, there is one technical lead um, at a CCP when it gets up and running, um, but that individual can't be the installer on, on every new uh, customer that comes on network. Um, and they've developed systems around training about how to do some of that more basic knowledge transfer. Um, and as an organization evolves, you then get specialization of skill and role. Um, so you have kind of, you know, you, what you would perceive as kind of the traditional, um, the traditional kind of telco model where you have the installer, the uh, network engineer, the help desk, um, et cetera. Um, we were uh, right there at stage two sustaining, then on to stage three, was, which is expanding. This gets into the more kind of market rate commercial sources of capital, both combination of debt and equity. Um, oftentimes uh, enterprises that uh, have CCPs that have high social purpose um, that are going into communities um, will still uh, use a bit of grant funding uh, at this phase. Uh, certainly one of the things that we encourage every CCP to do is to be able to benchmark the cost of their service against alternatives into the market and begin to quantify that social benefit. Um, it's incredibly powerful. We see it all of the time. Uh, all of these amazing CCPs that kind of just do the work, right? They provide these amazing services at below cost because that's what the community can afford. Um, and they're so focused on just getting the connection live, getting the school connected, they don't always kind of collect all of that information to say, well, here's the value that we provided that community. Um, and that value was funded by something. It was funded, whether it was a cross subsidy from an anchor tenant, whether it was uh, uh, actual uh, members of that community agreeing to subsidize the local school, et cetera. Um, but it's really important as entities, as CCPs grow to be able to quantify that and then when we talked about earlier being proactive, being able to tell people that story. You know, we connected X number of schools, residents, low-income residents, uh, um, you know, at this cost, we subsidize this number of connections. And what it does is it builds that case that this is not just, you know, a, a, a regular um, kind of for-profit provider looking to um, kind of grow at all costs, that there is, uh, it's a quantifiable measure of impact. This last phase um, uh, is kind of the maturing phase. At this phase, you know, you tend to get into what we would say would be kind of 25,000 plus uh, uh, subscribers. Um, the, the financial markets uh, by and large begin to function uh, a lot better at this phase. You can get traditional sources of capital. Um, 
it's still kind of always tough, you know, in general, there's, you know, investing in, in to, uh, to internet service providers and to, to mobile operators, et cetera. It's a bit of a specialized field. So it's, there is still challenges here, but the investment risk is vastly decreased. Um, what we like to explain to most CCPs is, um, you know, your goal should be to take the go to zero risk off the table as soon as you can, right? Once you're at a network of a sustainable size, a thousand subscribers or so, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to just kind of completely go kaput. Um, usually it's a matter of the rate at which you scale, the rate at which you're able to bring more capacity online and the rate at which you can connect more customers, but you are a, a, a business that's going forward. Um, we like to call that the calisthenics uh, part of, of growing a, a, a CCP. Um, it's, you know, kind of basic, um, you know, muscle training and every day you got to get up and run five miles. Um, and then hopefully after a year, two years, three years of operations, you kind of put your head up and then you see, wow, you know, we've got 25,000 customers on network. We're covering um, all of these different areas. And, and that's really where the social mission begins to shine. because You can um, kind of see, um, you know, all of the, the digital transformation that has taken place because of that. Let me then jump uh, to... Um, this uh, uh, next slide. This is something I talked uh, about a little bit earlier in the initial introduction, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Um, this is the difference between a, uh, a grant-supported capital, sub-commercial, commercial, and then some of the de-risking strategies. Um, one of the things uh, that is uh, critically important to understand is that the typical uh, financing pathway for CCPs, it depends upon the financial sustainability of um, an operator. We went into some basic, for those of you that took uh, microeconomics, um, you'll, you'll see some familiarity in the charts, but we just tried to describe kind of uh, uh, revenue and returns to revenue and different points along that revenue curve at which sustainability occurs. Um, and I think what's so critical there for any operator is to A, benchmark where you're at today and directionally understand where you want to go and what are some of the ways to get there. Um, and it's a combination of user growth, decreasing costs, et cetera. But um, ultimately, it, it hopefully gives you a directional sense of where you are today and what are some of the most immediate steps you can to get to that next level. Um, specifically, under these four broad buckets, grant supported, these are uh, kind of traditional uh, uh, mechanisms that many of you have heard of. Certainly, tax exempt donations, in kind infrastructure, what we like to call vertical assets. Um, so, you know, the school that got a, uh, a subsidized connection also let you put a tower on top of it. That is a vertical asset, um, or sorry, let you put a high side on top of it. That is a vertical asset. There is a, often a cost to that. Um, and that's where uh, kind of the buy-in from the community and the, the connectedness make it possible um, because it is a, a, you know, it's a collective effort. People see, you know, we need to grow this network. We need so many high sites this building, this municipal building, this school, this library, this health clinic um, is able, to, it has that a, a asset, has connect, uh, is, you know, on the grid, is connected to power, et cetera. Um, it allows you to um, cross subsidize that in, in a different way by providing a vertical asset and then trading it uh, for that connectivity. Um, some of the other mechanisms, just to go through quickly, a uh, combination of tax credits, impact incentives, certainly universal service funds, startup subsidies, uh, and broadband vouchers uh, was another example that we went into uh, as well. One of the things that I think is really important to call out, which is obvious, but I don't think it gets enough attention, is um, when you look at the six, when you look at the large scale CCPs that have grown in the rural north, they often required a degree of subsidy from government that by and large does not exist in more developing countries. Um, you know, it, one of the challenges with operating a network uh, is you are competing against the, you know, the social pressures of a government to provide multiple other things. So, I um, mean, you know, a subsidy that goes towards connectivity is also competing as a subsidy to other sectors, et cetera. Um, so kind of the financing ability of government to be able to fund those different uh, voucher schemes comes into play. Who provides that? How does it come to bear? Um, that's, you know, I think it's an important thing to call out and it's an important realization for a CCP to understand um, whether they're going directly to their government or 
um, a, a, an international NGO, et cetera, to be able to provide that. And the next category, and I'll move a little bit quicker because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end, is subcommercial capital. Um, subcommercial capital, this is what we would call patient equity, recoverable grants, quasi equity, revenue based financing, convertible uh, loans. Um, in the municipal sense, it's the bonding capacity of the local government. Uh, it's concessionary loans, guarantees, uh, government equity in different uh, instances. Um, but it is uh, uh, often subcommercial capital. What we like to think about is take the risk-free rate in any given market. The risk-free rate is usually a general obligation bond, uh, which is priced by any government that usually becomes the risk-free rate, and then you can move down from there. So um, you take a geo bond, for example, in Kenya right now, it's priced somewhere in the 10% range. Um, you know, so we would be just uh, below that. And then you get a sense of that is what uh, sub-commercial capital looks like in that market. Uh, the last one is commercial sources of capital. Um, I'll leave less time to this because it's something that broadly folks are, are uh, uh, aware of, but it is bank loans, commercial credit, vendor financing, um, everything from private equity, venture capital. Um, uh, in the much later stages, there's the equity markets that are working. Um, but by and large, the big piece of this is uh, the banking system and being able to get access uh, to bank loans. Um, on the bottom of this chart, one thing I, I do want to talk about is de-risking strategies. These de-risking strategies broadly overlay um, all of the different financing mechanisms, um, but there's some very critical ones. And we tried to go deeper on the ones that we uh, saw were most prevalent in markets. Uh, two that I want to highlight, uh, one is demand aggregation. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the wholesale, uh, you know, you get it wholesale with scale. So as you're buying more, um, you get a better price. Uh, so a lot of times um, when a, a community connectivity partner is aggregating demands, uh, is aggregating demand, sorry, for a uh, backhaul service, for example, uh, they can get better pricing. Um, you can, you just have more pricing power. You're able to, to uh, bid that out at a much more cost-effective price and pass that savings on to further advance your social mission. Um, the next one, which we think is, is very critical, is this idea of pre-sale uh, and, and down payments. Uh, this is in the barn example I gave earlier, but it's really letting users also uh, become the financiers and, and frankly, the, the, the biggest um, kind of proponents of the network. Um, one of the examples that we thought was so powerful um, uh, uh, was from Thailand where they had users actually put down a three to $10 deposit depending on size of connection they needed. Um, but it was relatively low dollar, but meant a lot for those folks, but it absolutely showed kind of the buy-in and the commitment um, and uh, kind of the, the demonstrated need um, that, that those people were willing to do because they saw the value in the service um, and getting that kind of reliability and affordability of connectivity. The last thing I'll mention here is this idea of anchor tenants. Um, a lot of times, and one of the common themes that we saw across all of these networks is being able to have an anchor tenant relationship in the very early days of running a CCP. Um, an anchor tenant is usually a large uh, capacity consumer on the network. So um, in, in, um, for a long time, many of you might be familiar with the NRENs, uh, um, university networks, et cetera, but they are those high capacity users, which become the, the anchor customer, um, the base load, if you will, of, uh, uh, of the community connectivity partner. They really enable kind of getting up to that minimum viability scale. Um, just to throw out a specific rule of thumb that we see somewhere around 20 to 40%. So if you're a CCP and starting out, if you can cluster together uh, anchor, uh, uh, um, anchor tenants around 20 to 40% of your total capital outlay, it really does begin to de-risk uh, your investment. So just to actually put a number on that, if you're doing, say, a $100,000 build, if you can secure contracts over, say, a two to three year period in that 20 to $30,000 range, that becomes um, great baseline revenue that you're then able to uh, invest into, uh, begins to kind of uh, get the motion running of uh, other uh, folks to buy in and, and um, um, gives you kind of more confidence in uh, going forward with that build. Let me uh, do this last slide and, and I will stop here and take questions. Uh, this is uh, what I think is one of the more powerful uh, uh, slides, but it is this idea of uh, 
different um, uh, different types of financing at different uh, moments. Um, and this was really uh, written from the point of view of the community connectivity partner. If you literally look at your financial statements, you're able to calculate what is called operating break even, total cost break even, financial break even. We map that against different sources of capital. By and large, if you figure out where you are at that phase, and then move over to the right hand side of, of this, you're able to see what are those grant supported uh, sources of capital, whether it's philanthropy, impact driven, ESG, um, uh, that's environmental, social and government led type investors, uh, and then traditional sources of capital as well. So um, with that, let me send it back over to Jane and uh, encourage anyone that has questions to please feel free to put those in the chat and ask away. Thank you, Ben. This was great. Thank you for that excellent overview. Uh, we are now going to turn to a practitioner in the field of a different type, someone who's actually working on a community network in um, Kenya. We have the pleasure of Risper uh, Akinya being with us today. She's with Tuna Panda um, Community Networks, Tuna Panda Net Community Networks. Risper, we're going to turn it over to you for about 15 minutes. Uh, we're running a little behind, but 15 minutes, 20 minutes to talk about um, an overview of what Tuna Panda is um, so that people can um, understand and explain why innovative financing and access to capital is key for your community network and um, other items related to kickstarting operations or kickstarting boosting other phases of your business model um, at Tuna Panda or any other uh, observations about access to capital and advice for um, other community networks and folks working with community networks. So Risper, who's there on the ground in um, Addis, we're gonna turn it over to you. Oh, I also got a flag that folks can't read um, the link. Uh, from the, the chat, evidently. Um, I'm gonna pop another link in the chat and read it out after Risper speaks so that you all um, can download the report. Evidently, we um, I popped in a, a link for a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. So my, my apologies. What I'll do is send you a PDF uh, link. Risper, over to you to hear more about Tuna Panda and financing. Um. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane Coffin. Um, um, it's really great to have this conversation at this time when community networks is becoming, um, is uh, gaining popularities and even communities are um, really getting to understand the importance of having and starting their own networks that serve their, their needs and their problems. Um, just to also, um, um, really build on what uh, Jane you mentioned um, communities will always organize to solve their own their own problems so for example in Kenya and where Tunapanda net we work um, where our community net network is located we have seen um, um, first of all it's it's in the informal settlement of Nairobi Kenya um, and uh, we have seen uh, how communities have always organized to uh, solve their problems. For example, uh, with um, something called Chama, where women have uh, came together and decided to uh, have a way of um, um, of banking um, in in, a, in the local setting and having a way to just finance themselves. And also, um, um, we have al also seen um, the community. Um, um, really organizing to have affordable even electricity that serve their needs and with uh with such um innovations uh we there are uh, it lacks a couple of things that really investment would really take care of for example the quality for uh the quality of uh, the services that are um that come across when uh, when community organize themselves for example in offering uh, electricity uh, that is coordinated by themselves we are seeing a lot of um, we've seen um, a couple of dangers with that um, and also just the safety around it is not well and even the impact as much as it is well uh, the intentions are well uh, but because of uh, the lack of financing the lack of support then you find that the quality is very um, very low and can even cause um, issues um, um, dire consequences to the members of the community um, and that is why for internet it's, it's very important to support uh, members who would want to uh, start um, 
um, connectivity for their community. So as uh, so that the uh, the connectivity is very affordable in in the sense and also very safe for the community. Um, looking at uh, when you when it's financed, then the um, the people who are uh, running the internet, the community itself feels very secure because it it is it is well uh, defined and when well structured. Also, this um, really affects the affordability. Of, uh, of the internet, much as uh, community networks are, uh, exist to provide affordable uh, internet for the community, there are these costs that could potentially affect that. But then if um, the whole initiative is well financed, then that really caters um, and reduces the, the, the price uh, of, of, of internet connectivity for the community. Um, so just to um, talk a little bit about uh, Tunapanda Net, we are um, low-cost community network based, as I mentioned, in the informal settlement of uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And our goal is basically to provide internet access that is really, um, that really um, take into consideration or reflect the realities of the community. Uh, we aim to build a digital um, ecosystem in uh, education, health, business, and CBOs uh, around um, around Kibera, where we are located. And uh, we do this just to enable um, that even as people are connecting in the online space, it, it really speaks to their social economic um, advancement. Um, and our focus, uh, our focus areas, we have three focus areas. That is our community connectivities. So we actually connect the centers with, uh, with internet. Uh, there's, uh, we also focus on digital inclusion. That is the after access. So what, um, how the internet is beneficial to, to the community. We do a lot of digital literacy just to uh, um, uh, help the members of the community to understand um, what, um, to, to understand um, how to really interact in the online space um, to make uh, their work visible um, and also to just support them in the work and the efforts that they're already doing in the community. And lastly, uh, we are also a MESO organization uh, and we support a cluster of community networks that are emerging, that are existing in Kenya, just to understand um, what it takes to start a community network, what it takes to um, operate a community network, as well as what it takes to sustain a community network. Um, and Part of uh, what we do with the national school is capacity building, and we have different areas um, that we really focus on. That is the network and infrastructure, just to talk on the deployment of um, of uh, of. Um, deployment of, uh, of the network and also uh, look at what now what it takes to sustain uh, to sustain um, the, the network and you are lucky for this year uh, to also have um, um, an expert uh, from um, from APC who just talked a little bit about the financing mechanism for uh, the paper that has just been presented <coughs> now um, some of the challenges that we have uh, seen, especially uh, with our work on ground with, uh, with other community networks. So when we started, we were working with seven um, community networks, uh, three of which were already existing and four were just um, were just emerging and there was interest um, to really take connectivity to, to their communities. And part of that was the re uh, part people, um, the refugee community, and uh, um, we trained, we took them through uh, training on uh, the, the three areas that, uh, that I've mentioned, just to really make them understand uh, what it really means to, to start and, and operate a community network. But then, um, even in the first phase, for the emerging community networks, we also encourage a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning where the already existing community networks would share with the emerging community networks on their efforts and what they are finding on ground. And some of the conversations that were coming up was with regards to equipment um, and um, how expensive it is to actually deploy, deploy the network. So uh, part of the conversations that we have been having is once we've uh, had the capacity building for this community network, 
networks. Uh, how can we then support them to actually deploy networks and to have a practical um, to, uh, to have connectivity for their communities without really struggling in terms of uh, the equipment that they would use to, uh, to make these connections. Um, and also another thing is, um, um, so for the first uh, iteration of the National School of Community Networks, we had seven community networks. And this was, um, of course, a funded uh, project thanks to uh, LockNet, um, who really supported the, the movement in terms of uh, um, finance, uh, financing uh, the learnings, the trainings, the capacity building uh, in, in Kenya and even in other countries within um, Africa and um, within the globe. Now. Um, we were to work with seven community networks, but then um, going um, when we started this uh, conversation, we found out that there are already existing uh, org organizations that were looking to. Uh, Start to provide connectivity for their communities uh, and they really wanted to be part of this capacity building and that uh, really um, we had to extend our or open um, open the the capacity building to more community networks and uh, the just concluded school we trained 11 community networks uh, but then um, even with that, we were not able to train all of uh, the people who uh, uh, the, the communities that wanted to be part of this uh, for, of this school. So there's there's need for for the school. There's need for uh, there are communities that are coming up and saying we want to start uh, connectivity for our community for different reasons to. Um, to amplify the work that the community is already doing, to help with education in, in, in the different communities, to help with, um, to assist with, um, um, for example, in, in, in the refugee, to assist the refugees to be able to connect and to, uh, to communicate with their, their families in different countries. But then we need more, uh, th there's need for finance, uh, uh, financing to really um, um, help assist in, having more and, and, and better capacity building uh, that accommodates uh, everyone and anyone who would want to, to really learn and understand what, uh, how to start, how to operate, and how to sustain a community network. Um, there's also um, um, one of the areas that we really focused on while we were training other community network was uh, local content creation. And with this is just to encourage, uh, even as, as the community networks are providing connectivity, uh, how do they focus on the after access um, for their communities? So just uh, if I, um, really looking into various ways that the community networks can really create local content that speaks to their realities, contents that are very relatable. For example, uh, in the just concluded school, there was a community network that um, uh, really uh, was um, very much interested and has ex had expertise to create animations uh, that really speaks to, to, to their community, animations to just highlight the culture, to highlight the heritage of, uh, of the specific community. And this um, needs, um, one of the ask was support in terms of equipment and tools that will help them to create such uh, um, such creations that would be uh, that would speak that will speak to their community, um, and that not only is animation, there are tools around podcasting, tools around uh, just creating lo uh, local content that is that is um, that focuses on on what the community is all about, and that promotes the cultures and promotes uh, the work that the community is doing. And then um, another challenge that we saw when we were doing uh, the National School of Community Networks was um, a, a lot of. Um, the community networks work with volunteers from from the community, so um, it's very so they they have 
they have another job that really sustains their living but then also they volunteer they are some part of their time to um, to work on um, providing internet to 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 their community now this is divided attention and as much as they would, they would want to support their communities they say they also want to sustain themselves uh, beyond um, to sustain themselves and sustain their families and so this really um, is a problem because when there is a lucrative uh, opportunity then there is shift in focus and that um, really affects the quality of uh, engagement with the community even as um, there is effort to um, engage them in, in, in the online and, and provide internet that will allow them to, to engage uh, online. So um, just to say that uh, there is um, there is uh, definitely a need to um, really look through the different ways that community networks can be able to uh, sustain itself. And part of the conversations that we've been having is uh, really drilling into the community ownership because there's the in-kind support that comes with the co from the community when the community network really speaks to uh, the needs of the community. So uh, really encouraging the different community networks to understand the values, to understand the strengths of their community even as they deploy the network and um, and um, also um, that the, there should be um, investment uh, going towards uh, community networks uh, being that they are really helping efforts that uh, the big ISPs are already doing in connectivity um, and uh, helping efforts that um, also really bring about um, interaction and bring about the uh, last mile population to the margin the last mile population to uh, to the conversation that is already happening online and just to help um, uh, to connect which is the, the the overall goal connecting the unconnected so um, yeah I think I will end I will end with that and uh, back to you Jen thank, thank you. you so much whisper that was an amazing perspective and we want to give a call out to you and the team at Tuna Panda Net, um, Community Networks for focusing also on um, the community itself and what community networks can do to sustain people for businesses and growth um, inside the network itself, uh, the community of the community network. I'll stop talking, turn it over to Juan Perano from the Internet Society. He's going to give us some of the rec recommendations from the report and likely ask each of our panelists for a quick uh, Q&A. And we'll probably do that in a speed round fashion. Over to you, Juan. Yes, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, speedy indeed. Um, just just uh, first to say that uh, at the Internet Society, we are very, very happy and very excited about this report because this gives us um, another tool in our toolbox uh, for us as, as as an organization but also for our community and especially in this in the context of, of sustainability of of connectivity providers this this is a great way of of us bringing more to the to the movement so we are really really excited about this and just to go over very very quickly um, um, over the recommendations um, ben, Adriana, Jane already mentioned many of this, so I will not go uh, over uh, the recommendations in detail, but just to highlight that in the framework of this report, we have three main stakeholders, the CCPs, the uh, community connectivity providers, governments and policymakers and funders. Um, and within those three categories, uh, the report highlights some of uh, key recommendations. Um, in, in the case of, of governments and policymakers, uh, this is something that the Internet Society and, and our partners have been doing for, for a while now, for, for many years actually, um, advocating for uh, CCPs and community connectivity providers to be within the connectivity uh, frameworks of the country and the legal frameworks and the licensing frameworks, and uh, for them to be able to access um, spectrum and to be, uh, to be able to access um, government funding or subsidies like other connectivity providers have out there. And also, um, 
and I think that's that's would be one of the main recommendations for 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 uh, policymakers and governments to be able to recognize that this is a solution that community connectivity providers are a valuable and sustainable solution uh, to connect the the unconnected in in those places where they are the hardest to reach and where traditional business models don't don't fully um, uh, don't fully uh, fit in 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 those in those conditions and in the case of of funders like the internal society we are a main stakeholder um in this report in the sense that we are um a grant giving organization so we are in the early stages of the of the, the deployment and developing the development of a, of a connectivity provider or community connectivity provider or community network or municipal network or whatever shape or form it, it takes and um I think for for us as a as a funder, the this framework of stages is key, and being able to focus on those on these stages and uh, recognize our place as funders in the different stages of the of the uh, of the timeline of, or, or the or the growth of the connectivity provider is key. So we know where to step in, where to step out, and help to get to the next stage. So. Um, as grant givers, we, uh, we are really keen to make sure that community connectivity providers can um, can evolve and become sustainable uh, as quickly as possible, but um, also to make sure that we can provide that support to uh, get to the next stage. And and finally, to um, uh, connectivity providers, community levels too. And I think um, I think it was mentioned before. Uh, make sure that you know where you stand, uh, make sure that you can tell your story and make sure that in the context of, of sustainability and financial sustainability, make sure that you um, can tell your financial story, that you know what you have, your their equity, you can recognize the value uh, that you have as a, as a community and as a community provider. So you can tell that story to when you go down that line of stages and be able to unlock uh, different streams of fundings. Um, I think with that, I will encourage everyone to, to look at the report. Uh, this is a great report. We have learned so much uh, building this report. Uh, we had some a lot of fun and we can talk about this for hours. So um, what I would like to do now is just to um, invite again our, our great panelists and maybe we can start with um, Rispert in just one, 30 seconds, just uh, what would be your um, message to, to, our, to our audience um, about this report and about, or about uh, any of your, your, um, your expertise about how to get to the sustainability and, and um, unlock financing mechanisms. Um, Rispert, back to you, 30 seconds, please. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I, for me, it's just to say that great work with the uh, with the with the report, um, and it, of course, it uh, really outlines the different ways a community network can leverage to uh, be able to um, finance um, uh, themselves. Maybe just to um, also encourage you to m simplify uh, that report just. Uh, for intake on ground because even when as, as when it was presented there was still um, a lot of um, questions and a lot of room to um, f for the CNs to really understand um, the different ways that they can um, use the report to uh, leverage on it and and, and, and really support the, their work so uh, thank you thank you very much Risper. then uh, maybe Adriana uh, 30 seconds highlights anything that you want to say to, to close this thank you juan well because these recommendations are both for funders for policymakers, and for the ccps i i think uh given the wonderful work that apc risa Madiga and all their their partners and, and peers have done in supporting capacity building in supporting the movement uh in supporting the, the infrastructures, the capex, uh, that it is important for us to to convey to the communities that from the very early stage of a community network, 
they have to align their mission with the financial sustainability. Uh, the support we've been giving them through grants, I think has been extremely valuable, but from the very beginning, they have to walk towards uh, sustainability in any of the models we talked about. And the other message as a former regulator, we have to keep insisting at the international and national level that regulation should never be a barrier, that the digital transformation we talk about globally needs not to be exclusive. Uh, we need digital inclusion, we need bottom-up connectivity models and eliminate barriers to access spectrum licensing and affordable backhaul. Uh, the communities are doing a great job to, to uh, manage their own destiny, but they need uh, enabling policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. Um, now, Ben, your closing remarks and, and recommendations for everyone. Uh, I knew I was going to get one mute here before the end of it. So <laughs> thank you so much, Juan, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, the one point that I think is absolutely critical that folks uh, walk away with is just the diversity of approaches that all of these community connectivity providers uh, take. And if there's one thing I, I, I hope people dive into, it's the case studies at the end. There's 11 different approaches that we tried to highlight of all different types of sizes, different geographical locations, different um, uh, technologies, whether it's fiber, fixed wireless, et cetera, uh, and use those case studies uh, as, as uh, inspiration um, and to give you some guidance on what is possible. Um, one of the statistics I always like to point to, which is, seems obvious, but it gives people a sense of what I mean by that diversity of approaches. Um, if you look at autonomous system numbers, ASNs, there's about a thousand mobile network operators in the world. It's about two to four in any given country, but there's about a hundred thousand um, uh, uh, what we would call fixed uh, uh, line networks. These are internet service providers of a variety of different sizes. Uh, and that just shows you all just the diversity of approaches. So there is uh, sector specific, geographic specific, uh, folks that are serving different niches of their markets. Um, so there's no ever one size fits all approach. And our hope with this report is that this provides you a set of the tools um, so some of those guardrails of success, um, but not necessarily gives you the direct answer. Um, it is an iterative process. What you will look like in year one versus year three versus year 10 is going to be different. Um, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of inspiration, gives you some baseline knowledge. Um, but uh, ultimately, it is working with your community to get that better answer uh, to provide the solution that ultimately works for you. So thank you all. Please do feel free to reach out uh, with any questions. Thank you very much, Ben. And and this is this is uh, certainly a highlight. This is this report is based on reality. These things are happening right now on the ground. So um, you you've seen it with Tuna Panda. This this is happening. Governments are changing their policies. CCPs are building networks. Funders are funding these networks. So um, this all exists, and you can reach out to any of us and to any of the people involved in this. In this report and uh, this has been great we can talk about this for hours and hours but um jane please if you want to close out this you bet um we're a little over time we thank everybody in the room we thank all of the panelists and we really really um, appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you to all of the speakers and in particular Tuna Panda for the local on the ground perspective, Con Cap, Ben Matranga, Adriana and Juan and Carlos, of course, who's here helping with the recording and we're going to be putting a report together. Um, and we really appreciate your time and energy. So please do take a look at the report. It's on the Internet Society's website the, and the Connect Humanities website. Thank you again. This is a really important issue. We're going to find ways to finance um, and make more, our networks more sustainable at the community level. Everyone have a good day and enjoy the rest of your time in Addis. <laughs>